While the diaphragm is considered the primary driver of breathing, there are many other muscles which affect breathing due to their influence on the rib cage and thoracic volume. I consider myself a student of martial arts and the human body. I'm not an expert, so learn for yourself. The diaphragm is considered the primary driver of respiration in the human body, and its action increases and decreases the thoracic cavity volume, which then allows, uh, pulls air into the lungs or pushes air out of the lungs. Now, there are a number of other muscles which affect thoracic cavity volume by moving the rib cage. Now, the rib cage is not a static or fixed structure. It is capable of, capable of moving in a couple different ways. So the ribs themselves move like a bucket handle. So they're able to swing up and down with respect to the sternum and spine. And then the sternum itself uh, moves like a pump handle and is able to move at an angle or swing kind of at an angle away from the spine. These two actions in combination or by themselves increase uh, volume in the thoracic cavity which allow more air to be pulled into the lungs and creating a bigger inhalation and then vice versa pulling the, the ribs going down and the sternum also going down decreases thoracic volume and pushes air out now if we notice the ribs labeled as false ribs ribs 8 through 12 these have a significant amount more of costal cartilage which connected to the sternum and this allows these ribs to have a greater uh, amount of articulation and be more influenced by the abdominal muscles. The true ribs, ribs 1 through 7, are more influenced by the movement of the sternum or the pump handle action. So starting at the top we'll go through the muscles which act upon the rib, rib cage uh, to move both the sternum and the ribs themselves. So starting the neck, we have the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which goes from the mastoid process at the back of the skull and goes to the sternum and the clavicle. Now this muscle both nods and turns the head, uh, turning the head when it's acting unilaterally and nodding the head when it's acting bilaterally. If the head is fixed, then this muscle will act upon the sternum and the clavicle and lift, add a lifting force to those structures. Now the scalenes act in a similar fashion to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, acting as a neck flexor and uh, when acting bilaterally and a rotational uh, muscle when acting unilaterally. Now the anterior and middle scalenes both connect to the first rib and the posterior scalene attaches to the second rib. So once again if the head is fixed now these muscles serve to elevate the first rib in the case of the anterior and middle scalenes and the second rib in the case of the posterior scalene muscle. Moving on to the chest or the anterior thorax we have the subclavius muscle which connects from the clavicle to the first rib, the pectoralis major which connects from the clavicle, sternum, and also the costal cartilage of ribs 1 through 7 and going from there to the humerus bone or the upper arm and then the pectoralis minor which connects uh, ribs 3 through 5 to the scapula. That's a good point to note that I'm listing all of the muscles that have connections to the rib cage. This doesn't necessarily mean that all of them are involved in breathing, but that they have the potential to act on the rib cage to increase or decrease volume in the thoracic cavity. A thorough study or examination using uh, EMG sensors is necessary to fully identify the contribution of all of these muscles during specific breathing practices. 
the subclavius likely is capable of pulling the top rib up towards the clavicle, thus increasing thoracic volume in combination with muscles like the pectoralis minor, which will pull the ribs three through five apart towards the scapula, assuming that the scapula is fixed. Similarly, we see that if the uh, humerus is fixed or the upper arms are held in place, activation of the pectoralis major will pull on the costal cartilage of the lower ribs or the ribs that it's the lower ribs that it's attached to to open widen the rib cage proceeding towards the sides and the back we have the serratus anterior and the serratus posterior the serratus anterior connects from the interior or deep side of the scapula to the first eight or nine ribs this muscle acts to protract the scapula or otherwise pull it around the rib cage However, if the scapula is fixed or retracted, the muscle can act to expand the rib cage by pulling the ribs laterally and posteriorly. The serratus posterior consists of two different muscles, the serratus posterior superior and the serratus posterior inferior. The serratus posterior superior connects from ribs two through five to the vertebrae of the spine, and these muscles act to elevate the rib cage. The serratus posterior inferior connects from ribs nine through 12 to the vertebrae of the spine, and these muscles act to depress the rib cage. The intercostals are a deep muscle group which connect the top of one rib to the bottom of the adjacent rib above it. These muscles consist of the external intercostal, internal intercostal, and innermost intercostal. The external intercostal is the most superficial of these and is considered to be most active during inhalation. The internal intercostal is in the middle of the external and innermost intercostals and is considered to be most active during expiration or exhalation. The innermost intercostal is, as the name implies, is the deepest of these muscles and its fibers go in the same direction as the internal intercostals and therefore is also most active during expiration. If we view each of these muscles from the side or lateral angle, we see that the external intercostal fibers move antero-inferiorly or downward and towards the front of the body and then the internal intercostals move in the opposite direction from the front going to the rear of the body also downward. In studying the intercostal muscles I came across an interesting conflict of in the references that I uh, used. Generally the external intercostals and inner internal intercostals are involved in inhalation and exhalation respectively but I come across some resources that state that the intercostals in general mostly involved in exhalation since they act to move the ribs closer together and therefore decrease thoracic cavity volume. Now I think a reason for this conflict is based on whether the first rib is fixed if the rib is first rib is already raised then the external intercostals allow or act to move the ribs upward and raise the ribs in that buck, bucket handle motion allowing for more volume in the thoracic cavity the abdominal muscles share many points of attachment with that of the diaphragm such as the xiphoid process and the costal cartilage. So we have the external obliques which connect to ribs 5 through 12 and the internal obliques which connect to ribs 9 through 12. Deep to both of those is the transversus abdominis which exists on the same layer as the diaphragm itself and interdigitates with the diaphragm in its connections to the ribs. These three muscles form the rectus sheath which I describe in my video on the abdomen. In addition to those three, we have the rectus abdominis, which connects to the costal cartilage of ribs 5 through 7, and the xiphoid process. And last, we have the quadratus lumborum, which connects from rib 12 to the iliacus and acts to depress the rib cage. The abdominal muscles in general are considered to be muscles of expiration or exhalation and play a considerable role in controlling and moderating intra-abdominal pressure, specifically the transversus abdominis. 
Now here's a few other muscles that can act and act upon the rib cage, but are generally not associated with breathing. In the upper left we have the subcostal muscles, which connect on the internal surface of the rib, ribs to the second or third rib below it. These are thought to be involved in depressing or pulling down the ribs. On the lower left we have the transversus thoracus, which connects on the internal surface of the sternum between the costal cartilage, the sternum, and the xiphoid process. And these are considered to be involved in depressing the costal cartilage. And then finally on the right we have the levatoris costarum and uh, other muscles in the erector spine which do their connection between the spine and the ribs uh, are thought to indirectly be involved in breathing by their capability of possibly pulling the ribs towards the spine. So those are the muscles involved in breathing due to their action on the rib cage. We still have to cover muscles such as the pelvic floor muscles which are involved in intra-abdominal pressure. In addition, muscles such as the psoas and the quadratus lumborum have fascial connections to the diaphragm itself. And I'll be putting out videos addressing both of those in the future. Until then, as always, I recommend checking out the references and learning for yourself. If you found this video interesting, hit the like button and share it up. If you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you'll be notified when my next videos come out. And if you're on Instagram, make sure you're following me as I post some videos on Instagram that do not go on YouTube. And while you wait for my next video, check out my previous videos covering muscles of the abdomen and fascia.